Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we are in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, and we resume our study in verse number 34. So if you can, open your Bible to Mark, chapter 8, verse 34. And I'll give you a minute to do that, as always, while I tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website. Please pay careful attention to this because the Word of God is the most important thing in the world. The Word of God contains everything that we need for life, eternal life, and godliness. So to avoid hell and to also live the way that God wants us to live, <clears throat> it's all found in the written word of Almighty God. And you can study that written word of God, Old Testament and New, with me at the Scripture Verse by Verse website. And that is found at the thebibleversebyverse.com. So check it out if you haven't already and begin that verse by verse study with me. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray that you would speak to us I pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 34, <clears throat> John or Mark chapter 8. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This idea that is so popular today, this idea that is so popular in evangelicalism, this easy believism where all you have to do is believe the facts about Jesus and you will be saved. And if at any time you ever did believe the facts about Jesus, you are saved and you will never be unsaved. That is a lie. That is not, that you cannot find that in the Bible. It is true we are saved by faith. You can find that in the Bible. But James says faith without works is dead. And Jesus defines those works somewhat for us right here. Again, verse 34, he called his people unto him with his disciples. He called the people unto him with his disciples and said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And everybody knew what Jesus was talking about when he said, If you're going to follow me, you got to take up your cross. Cross was an instrument of of execution. In other words, get on fire for Jesus. Lukewarmness is not okay. Lukewarmness is not sufficient for Jesus. One foot in the world, one foot in sin, one foot in, in Christ, it's not going to cut it. Not with Jesus. He's saying you must do what the Bible says. He's saying you have to live the way God wants you to live. He's saying you have to please Jesus even if it means the loss of friends, even if it means sacrifice, suffering, and yes, even death. That's what the cross is about. Crucify your desires, your will to follow mine. That is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying you cannot be the most important thing to you. I must be the most important thing to you. You say, well, I don't want to do that. I'm not ready to make that kind of a commitment to Christ. Well, you're not willing to make any kind of commitment to Christ because that's the only commitment that there is that he accepts. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Well, then enter into a Christless, saviorless, 
hellfire eternity because there is no plan B to what Jesus laid out here. There is no other option for you except hell. Take it or leave it. Repent of your sin. Ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and be serious enough about it where you are willing to take up your cross and follow him. Die to self, live for Jesus. And yes, we all fail. Confess when you fail and get right back on track. It's an attitude thing, not a perfection thing. 34 and 35. And when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, <clears throat> Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. If a person chooses to live in disobedience to God, rejecting Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior, then they will lose their soul. I said they will lose their soul. That means hell. That means suffering in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Pain, torment, nonstop, hideous, horrific, terrible suffering that will never end, that will never lessen, that will never go away. And that means enduring God's wrath for all eternity. We're not talking about salvation by works here. Jesus did not promote salvation by works, and neither do I. <clears throat> it is salvation by faith. And it is what the book of James, which I've already mentioned, is talking about when it says faith without works is dead. That verse goes in perfect harmony with this, what Jesus is saying right here. 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Two seconds in hell. And people will realize that they were absolute fools of the worst kind to disregard a message like the one I'm giving you today and to reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And they won't need to wonder if their present torment is worth any pleasure that their sin gave them during their lifetime, they won't have to wonder. They will have their answer immediately. It was not. People reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because they don't want to give up some sin. They don't want to give up control of their life to a Savior and to the written Word of God, and they don't want to give up some sin. There's at least one sin in their life that they don't want to give up. But what they don't understand is that when they die and go to hell, they're going to give up those sins anyway. That money that you have put before God you're going to leave it behind. You're not taking one cent with you. It's not going to do you one bit of good in the, in the lake of fire. It's not going to make the flames of hell one less, one bit less hot for you. It's not a question of will you or will you not give up your sin. Only a question of when. Now? And turn to Christ and be saved from hell? Or when you're in hell? That's up to you. But you're going to give it up. <clears throat> Verse 38, Whosoever, therefore, <clears throat> shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. If somebody is ashamed of the Bible, you're ashamed of the Bible. That's why you don't want to receive Christ, right? Right? 
Some of you, you're ashamed of the Bible. You would be ashamed to live it. If you're ashamed to say that you believe the Bible, if you're ashamed to live the Bible, if you are ashamed to be connected to Jesus Christ, then Jesus says that he will be ashamed of you when he returns, which is talking about judgment day, but we can take it one step further. When you die and you go stand before him, he's not going to give you a pat on the back. He's going to give you a swift kick right into hell. If you don't live for Jesus here, if you are ashamed to be connected to Jesus here, then don't expect him to help you after you die because your lack of devotion to Jesus Christ and lack of commitment to Christ is proof positive that he was never your Lord and Savior and then you're going to go to hell and pay for your own sins. Chapter 9, <clears throat> And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there are some of them that stand here who shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Hmm. No one but God could say with, the, with certainty that this or that was going to happen. And Jesus just did. No one but Jesus because he is God, could say with certainty that you are going to do this or that at any time or before you die, like he said here. No one can say that. Anyone else who talks like that is being sinfully presumptuous. But Jesus can speak with certainty about that and anything else. Everything that he said is absolute truth, and he can speak with certainty, and he did, about everything that he uttered because he is God. And as far as knowing what you were will not what you will or will not do before you die, that's not a problem for Jesus, because he's the one who holds the keys to death, the Bible says. He knows how long we live, we will live, and he knows exactly what we are going to do every minute of our life, every precious moment that he gives us. And here Jesus says to his disciples, there will be some that stand here right now who shall not taste death until they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. When's the kingdom of God going to come with power? Eh, there's a couple fulfillments of this, which isn't unusual. Lots of times there are a double, of, double fulfillment of a prophecy given by a prophet, or in this case, the Son of God himself. The kingdom of God came with power to start the church age on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came on the apostles and they spoke with tongues. And everybody was amazed. That was a show of power. And it wasn't gibberish. It was a language that the people there understood, even though they were from different, different parts of the world. And the kingdom of God will also come with power when Jesus returns. Oh, what a day that will be. So, Jesus says there's some people standing here that aren't going to die until they see the kingdom of God come with power. Well, all the apostles were alive on the day of Pentecost. They saw it come with power on that day. But there's something else. There's that second fulfillment, there's also a sneak preview involved. Look at verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up onto a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. So Peter, James, and John, the so-called inner, inner circle of apostles, see a quick preview of a coming attraction. In other words, they get a glimpse of what the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to be like. And keep this in mind. Keep this in mind. Those of you who dare to doubt the word of God, and the fact that Jesus Christ is going to return. Jesus is the one who promised this preview and then six days later delivered it. He also promised his actual second coming and just as sure as he made good on the first promise, he will make good on the second. And this brings up a larger issue regarding prophecy. 
in the Bible, true prophets of God often used to give their long-term prophecy. And then to show that they were trustworthy, they would give a short-term prophecy as well. So they would say, this, in the last days, this is going to happen, or, you know, somewhere way down the road, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, okay. And then they'd give another one, another prophecy that was going to be fulfilled a lot sooner. And then whoever they talked to would know, okay, the first one came to pass, the second one will too. So, see, what does that have to do with me, Moret? Maybe nothing, but in this day and age, probably something. If you are ever in a situation, and you certainly may be, when some self-proclaimed prophet, normally in a Pentecostal, charismatic type environment, you are ever in a situation where someone says, the Lord told me this, God showed me this, God told me this was going to happen someday. Or thus saith the Lord, this is going to happen in the future. Or thus saith the Lord, God wants you to know this or that. God told me to tell you this or that. And this is what you must do. God told me. You tell that person to prophesy something that is going to happen an hour from now. Or tomorrow morning. And when it does not happen, which it won't, when it does not happen, you can tell that person that he or she is fortunate that they're not living in Old Testament days or they, they, they'd be taken outside the city and stoned to death for being a false prophet. Because God doesn't take kindly to people who speak up and presume to speak in his name only to be telling lies or the imaginations of their own heart. I've had run-ins with would-be prophets, and this is what I have told them. I've told them similar things. And they've gotten angry, and they've stormed away from me, and I'm, goodbye. Like my mom used to say, good riddance to bad rubbish. That's what she used to say a long time ago. Good riddance to bad rubbish. I like that. Verse 3. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white, as snow, such as no fuller on earth could whiten them. The white here that the apostles saw, they saw Jesus light up. And it was a white that they never saw in their entire life. And remember what this is. This is a preview of his second coming. Boy, we are going to see things that we never saw before, including colors. We are going to see many things that we never saw before, when Jesus returns and after he returns, and we're in our resurrected bodies, life is just going to explode with sounds and colors that are going to be wonderful. And we just get a little preview, or at least they did. This amazing, never-seen-before white suggests that we are going to experience colors in heaven and on the new earth in our resurrected body that we can't even see today. We're not capable of seeing it. You mean there are colors out there that we can't see? Oh, yeah. You know, actually, frogs and fish and birds have greater color vision than we do. They distinguish more colors than we can. And the fact that the disciples saw white like none had seen before just was another preview of, of eternity. The sounds and the sights of heaven and the new earth and our resurrected body are going to be something that we could not imagine. It's going to be so much fun. Verse 4. And there appeared unto them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. So right when you, you think you've seen it all, if you're Peter, James, and John, no, you haven't seen it all, because Elijah and Moses show up on this mountain talking to Jesus. Or this, this 
carries with it so much truth, it's impossible to describe it to you all, all of it. You know why? Because I don't know it all. But I'll tell you this, it had been several centuries since the death of Moses and Elijah. Several centuries since both Elijah and Moses were dead. Number one, they didn't cease to exist because here they are. And number two, physical death did not change their identity. They are still Moses. They are still Elijah, as we see in this verse. So, I've lost my mom and my dad, my sister, my brother. My other sister has lost her husband. So I've lost two brother-in-laws too. These are all, you know, relatively short time. My mom and dad have been gone for 20 years. But the rest of these brothers and sisters and brother-in-laws haven't been that long. But it doesn't matter if it's five years, six months, 20 years, 25 years, or three centuries doesn't matter. My sister is still my sister. Carol is still Carol. My brother Tom is still Tom. My dad and my mom, they're still there. They still have their names. They're still Margaret. They're still Wilson. My brother-in-law is Jerry. Don. They're both Jerry and Don. And so are your relatives who have passed away. Because you will always be you. You do not lose your identity. You will always be you. Just like Moses and Elijah were Moses and Elijah centuries after they had experienced physical death. And something else, you will always have your personality. You will have your sense of humor. You will have your memories, at least the good memories. The big difference is all of these things are going to be perfectly sanctified. You are going to be everything that you are now except without sin. And this is either good news or bad news depending on how you take it. But you'll be in that body that you're in right now. You say, well, I don't think I want it. But you will want it. It'll be okay. It'll be okay because you're going to trade it in for a new one. It'll be the old one, but it's still going to be a new one, rebuilt, refurbished, glorified, raised, and perfect in every way. And capable of dying, and capable of getting sick, able to do amazing things, physical, including eating. How about that? And touching and being touched. You will always be you. Just like Moses and Elijah were Moses and Elijah. Five. And Peter spoke and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And I don't blame Peter for saying that. Sometimes he gets laughed at for saying this because it was kind of an off-the-wall thing to say. But he said, Let's, hey, I got a suggestion. Let's all stay on this mountain forever. And I don't blame him for wanting that. Retreating to a mountain with Jesus and a couple of Old Testament superstars sounds like a pretty nice idea to me. But, and so Peter makes a suggestion and that's where we have to be careful. Okay? We should not make suggestions without First, understanding the facts, which is what Peter did. Never make a suggestion without first understanding the facts. So it seemed right to Peter. It seemed good to Peter. But it was contrary to Scripture. It was not right to God. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The Bible says man has ideas, but God decides what will happen and what needs to happen. 
And that's why so many of our prayers that we think are great, right on target, are not given a yes answer. Six. Well, here's God's commentary on what Peter said. He knew not what to say, for they were sore afraid. So, and I wonder, I'm not second-guessing God, but as a way to illustrate what I'm thinking, I wonder why sometimes, since we, he designed us so wonderfully, sometimes I wonder why God did not create a mech, mech, mechanism in human beings that would cause our jaws to automatically clamp shut whenever we are overcome with emotion. That would have been a nice addition. And I say that because people sometimes say foolish things when they are highly emotional. So he's given us a free will. We can choose not to do it. And I think it's a good idea to keep our words to a minimum or to zero when we are emotional, especially if we're afraid or angry. There's less of a chance that we're going to say something illogical, unbiblical, something that we no doubt will regret if we just keep our mouth shut. Seven. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Now, without realizing it, Peter kind of, lumped Jesus, Moses, and Elijah together in a group, didn't he? Because his suggestion was, Jesus, how about if I build three booths, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah? He kind of lumped them all together there. So the Father has to quickly appear in the form of a cloud and set Peter and the rest of us straight. Now, Moses and Elijah were spiritual heroes. They were spiritual heroes, especially to the Israelites. But no one, not even those two, are equal to Jesus. So the Father speaks from heaven and says, Jesus is my son. You must listen to him. The rest of us, are his servants. Jesus is his son. So listen to, you, listen to the Lord Jesus Christ and the written word of Almighty God more than you listen to anyone else. And that, see, that's why I'm, I'm going all the way through the New Testament, beginning with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because we're going to do a whole lot of listening to Jesus. And I hope you're enjoying it, because I sure am. Listen to Jesus more than you listen to anyone else. In other words, listen to what the Bible says more than you listen to anything else when it comes to spiritual, moral, and eternal and behavior issues. Verse 8, we'll wrap it up for today. And suddenly, when they had looked around about, they saw no man anymore, save Jesus only with them. So instead of returning to heaven with Moses and Elijah, after a brief visit, Jesus was alone. He stayed on earth. You know why? It's because Moses and Elijah's work was completed. On earth, their work was completed. But Jesus still had work to do here. He had to continue ministering to the people. He had to continue instructing his disciples. And most importantly, he stayed in order to die on the cross to pay for our sins. Out of time. Continue studying with me at the Scripture Verse by Verse website which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out. Study from Genesis through Revelation at your pace, at your convenience. And if you want to be a part of this ministry, and I pray that you do, because I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. For over 30 years, this has been a faith ministry. So if you want to be a part of this ministry and stand with me and help me to get out the Word of God, pray for me, would you? Please pray for me. Pray for the Word. And when you take a break from studying, click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. I would appreciate it. Until next time, Michael Morant for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.